Hello, welcome back to another episode of the human side of learning and talent technology. I'm Bennett with Chris and Tiffany, as always, and we're back, but we're back a little differently. We're zooming it. We're remote. We're in between offices right now. Chris kicked us out of the old office and didn't have a new office ready for us yet. So we're slumming it. No, I'm just kidding. We're hanging out at home. Things are good. We're all working remote, um, but we are uh, kind of having to do our podcast a little differently. So we're on Zoom. Hopefully the audio sounds okay. And if you're checking us out on YouTube, you'll get to see all three of our faces all next to each other on, on Zoom, which is pretty cool, a little different than what we're normally doing. But how's everyone today? How's working from home? And what's what's new? So I kicked you out, huh? <laughs> we did. We, we have did. nowhere I guess to go. we did a little bit, didn't we? You know what? The lease was up. And it was time to move. And I know on our last podcast, we talked about that was going to be the last time and in our old studio and the new one's getting built out and uh, all the fun of Snowmageddon, I think, has delayed things a little bit because it's not just the week delay, but what ended up happening was it delayed supply chains. So supply chains were delayed for for parts and pieces and light fixtures and other things. And, and now it'll be another couple of weeks before we're actually able to get in but we're going to get there in the meantime. I definitely miss seeing everybody in the office, but it's good to see the two of you here on Zoom. Likewise. How's everything over in your neck of the woods, Tiffany, working from home? It's just peachy. In fact, I think I'm going to miss it when the new office does open. However, um, I'm starting to feel a little of the old COVID days coming back where I feel a little trapped in the house. So I am looking forward to the office opening up and, and being able to be there with everybody um, on site. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it as well. I miss seeing faces. I, as we talked about in the last podcast or two, I got a, I got a new puppy for some, for some strange reason. Uh, and yeah, so being at home... That? Be, yeah, that's, I don't know. He's great, but he's also a monster. Puppy. Yeah. <laughs> but being at home, you know, working from home is, is, has really helped kind of, you know, get him trained a little faster, get him up to speed on, on life as a, as a puppy under, under the, you know, this household and with his other dog and, and my roommate. So it, it's been good. It's been distracting at times, but also, also fun and he's he's finally quiet i don't hear him yelping in his kennel right now so we're good we got a, we got an hour or two <laughs> awesome i heard you uh i heard you did something fun and uh had his dna tested to find out what he is i did he's a mixed Puppies. breed so i i like to to rescue dogs and so you kind of never know what you're going to get even though you know they may tell you it's it's this it's really not that or a whole combination of other things. So I did do a DNA test and found out that even though they, they kind of labeled him as a Husky mix and he's majority Husky, he's only like 18% Husky um, according to the DNA test and seven other breeds in, in his mix. So he's got some great Pyrenees necks, some German Shepherd, Australian Shepherd, Treeing Walker Coonhound, which I've never heard of, but I think that's pretty cool. Some I'll Alaskan Mal that. yeah, Alaskan Malamute, which is the the kind of the bigger version of a husky, and eight point seven percent Chow Chow, which I thought was interesting too. So oh, he's definitely a uh, a super mutt, as they call him. He's got a whole bunch of like DNA strands from like I think twelve or fifteen different breeds. So he's got a very interesting uh, family tree. They, it's pretty cool the thing that they, they do they send you this cool little video of like you know pulls on your heartstrings a little bit and and um they also send like the family tree so it kind of they can tell what his grandparents were what their the great grandparents were and kind of they can kind of trace it back to if there are any full breed full breed dogs that kind of contributed to his mix it's kind of where that plays into his his um family tree so pretty interesting stuff and, and they do like full health dna reviews so they can kind of figure out if he's got any markers on his dna that could be genetic disorders or you know those types of things down the road so it's i think it was a pretty good investment kind of getting to to see the full cool. picture of who marty is 
So what Since was you've talked about was... Marty and you're at home, then at one of these podcasts, before we go back to the office, you're going to have to bring Marty. But if you bring Marty, that also means Tiffany's going to have to show us the goats. Not bringing the goats into the house. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you can go outside with the goats. I can't take the camera out. We'll take a field trip. Can you can you somehow get the goats right next to this window right here? <laughs> no, no. That would be my front flower bed. No. Uh oh, oh uh, yeah, they probably have a snack in there. Oh yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Their favorite thing is rose bushes, which is interesting because you would think that rose bushes with thorns would deter farm animals from eating it. It's absolutely their most favorite thing to have. So. Um, yeah, they're not allowed out of the back because I love my goats, but I love my roses more. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me. Just one, I did. A, I went to a crawfish boil um, last week, this last weekend, and that reminds me of crawfish. Like, it's a whole lot of work to, and like you get your fingers kind of cut up, and it's a whole lot of work to get a tiny bit of meat, but it's so good that you just fight through it and. Don't worry about the thorns because at the end of the day, you're going to get, you know, those tasty roses. <laughs> so, so roses are the crawfish for, in the goat world, huh? Apparently, yes. I'm learning something new today, but now, now we know. You guys are cracking me up. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to write that one down. Uh, Point a phrase. It'll be a, like one of those inspirational things on the wall at an elementary <laughs> school. Is, ro roses are goats crawfish. That, I don't think that makes any sense, but. <laughs> but anyways, so back to maybe something relevant to our listeners. <laughs> um, today, we're, we're, we wanted to jump into user experience and, and kind of what that means, um, especially as it relates to human, I mean, uh, the human side of learning and talent technology, but now learning and talent technology, um, how our clients are using it, how we help our clients um, either rebuild it or revamp it or, or um, kind of just strategize around it. Um, and then, you know, just you know, the overall impact of user experience on, on end users within the system. So um, Tiffany, why don't I start passing it over to you? Can you kind of just give us a, an overview of what user experience is and, and, and what that means in our, in our world? Sure. Um, I'll start with, it's more than the way that the screen looks. And I think a lot of times when clients talk about user experience or they go into a project and one of their number one objectives are, we've got to improve the user experience. Naturally, people tend to think about the way that the software looks when you log in. And that is part of user experience, but there's so much more around that. And there's more or there are many more ways that you can impact the user experience outside of just the way the screen looks. And a couple of those things, and one of the biggest things that for me that I see with our clients that is an impact for their end users is accessibility to, to the content. So you can have a beautiful system with all the bells and whistles, but if I'm an end user and I log in and I cannot get to the training that I want to take or I need to take, obviously the user experience is a negative one. And so there's things around just how you, the decisions you make around managing the LMS or setting up and configuring the LMS that may have major impacts in a positive way and or negative way around user experience. A lot of times clients go through demos of when they're going through their selection process and they get to see the, the awesome screens and the bells and whistles but then you implement it and you make your decisions and implementation, you realize what you end up with isn't necessarily what you saw in a demo. And that's because of the decisions that around the configuration or the setup of the system had more impact to the user experience than just the way that the, the software was built to look. Um, and then one other piece that I like to highlight on is a lot of people don't always associate the impact that change management has on the objective of improving the user experience. Um, they typically think of those two things as totally separate things. And usually change management is the thing that nobody really wants to think about or talk about because it's not necessarily the most fun part of any implementation. But 
how you inform your end users and you set their expectations and you communicate with them about what they're going to be doing or what they get out of the new LMS or why you're moving into a new talent management platform has an impact on what they're going to expect when they log in and what they see and how they use the system. If you communicate very little and don't set those expectations or if you will draw the picture for them of, of what, what the purpose, the reason and what's in it for them, when they log in, they've got some preconceived notions of what they want to see or what they thought it would be or what they've used in the past. And when it doesn't align with what is really set up or in front of them or, or the, the purpose behind the system doesn't align with their expectations, it's going to be a negative experience and they're going to, you're going to have low adoption numbers still. It doesn't matter how nice it looks. And so when we talk about user experience with our clients and they talk about the objective of user experience, improving the user experience, a piece of it, yes, is can we make it flashy? Can we remove all the buttons we don't need? Can we get them directly to where they want to be? Um, within one to two clicks. That's all a very important aspect of it. But there's these other components that you don't take a lot of investment, if you will, or don't have to take a lot of investment and you can still improve the user experience. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, you may be sitting into a, in a system right now going, wow, the user experience is terrible. We need to start looking at or going through a selection process for something new because people just aren't using it you might not really need to do that. And it, it might not even really take a whole design. You may have to adjust how you're using it and how you're communicating around the system to get the users or to solve those pain points for the users so that it improves the experience they're having. Chris, Bennett, do you either yep. want to be? To I, 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 love, I love the term that you're using there, Tiffany, in terms of accessibility, because the speed at which we're able to get to and interact with the information, the training, the knowledge that we need to be able to do a job becomes very, very critical. And, and I think that the, to your point, the more time that it takes to get access to that information, the less critical it's gonna to become to the learner, the more frustrating it might become to the learner. And anytime we create that level of frustration and negative interaction, it's going to lessen the retention of the critical information that we need to provide. And we see that that accessibility becomes the crux of why you've got a system to be able to, be able to manage and kind of drive ease of access to information courses, content data for not only the learner, but also the manager. So I love that term accessibility. It's just, it's what, could be the primary focus for a lot of organizations that are looking to improve and perfect what they're doing inside of any piece of learning technology. Another piece around the accessibility part that I want to highlight that I see and hear from clients too is well, we've made all of our training available or we've, we've given visibility in the LMS to all of our training. And when I'm talking about accessibility, it's not just can they get to it in the LMS. Um, part of it is, is really understanding, and we, we use the terms user journeys or even you know, identifying your personas. Who are your people that have to take and consume training? And when do they have to consume it? And what are they doing? There's a very different experience for a bank teller versus somebody who works on a manufacturing floor that doesn't have a workstation and a laptop that they log into on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the accessibility isn't just, can we see e-learning inside the training? It's how, does, how do each of the personas inside of your organization get to the information that they need to have to do their job or that you want them to leverage to do their job? Yeah, that's a good segue, Tiffany, into kind of my next question or next topic was around user personas. I mean, every every group, I mean, there can be so many groups defined within a particular organization, uh, whether it's by, you know, demographic or job role or, um, you know, really so many different things. Um, you know, generations, I think, use, yeah. use and consume content in different ways or, or use the internet or, or a cloud-based system in different ways, you know? So there's, there's mm -hmm. things to be thought about there. 
Um, so, so Chris, when we talk about user personas and accessibility to learning and talent content within a system, what are some specific ways or, or tips or tricks that organizations are using to, to kind of define those user personas, but not just define them, but then what do you do from there? How, how do you turn that into a, a, you know, actual user experience or actual um, impact in, inside the systems that you're, that you're using? Yeah, I think, but it, one of the, the, just that entire question around those user personas, really understanding your population. And Tiffany, you were alluding it, to it, and we think about somebody on a manufacturing line that may, or a shop floor that may not have access to uh, a computer. They're not assigned a computer. In fact, it, it's changed, but a number of years ago, uh, y'all can probably remember the number of organizations we were helping get, getting started on learning systems. They're like, well, not all of my people have email addresses. How are we going to get it's access? Still thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit different now. It's like, well, how can we text all of them? Because everybody has a computer in their hand, right? I got my computer. Here it is. Uh, and, and let me go access that way. Um, and it also brought to mind something that I think is kind of funny. So one of my good friends that that has a business over in Netherlands, and they're making learning accessible via cows. Did you say cows? Cows. Computer on wheels. Computer okay. on wheels. Oh. And he calls them cows. And I'm sitting there at the beginning and he's going, Yeah, we're making learning accessible via cows. And I'm like, I'm just not really getting the entire cow thing. We're from Texas. I'm thinking like I've got goats. Does that work? I got a cow out back, right? I don't really have a cow out back. But but that's a little bit of humor. But we look back at it and the fact that let's go put an iPad on wheels. Let's go put a computer on wheels to be able to roll around and begin to give access to people to even get to the systems. I think that ha those type of things have to roll into the entire persona in that user journey that you were talking about, Tiffany. So it's not just, okay, well, I'm gonna singularly focus on what happens in the system because yeah. we talk about what's in system and what's out of system. And the out of system process here for this particular user on a manufacturing floor is I actually have to provide them a computer to get access to information, or I have to provide them access to virtual learning, or I've got to provide access to classroom or to compliance training or whatever it might be. And so I think in that user journey, we have to start with the process of saying, well, how am I even going to get them to the point that they're going to have access to the systems that contain the information that we look at? And those different personas become very, very critical in, in that process. And then there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of desk workers that obviously have computers, they have access, they can get to the VILT, they can go to co coaching mentoring tools, they can get to a wide variety of e-learning and systems. And then we have to make those pieces and processes work and make that user journey work. But one thing, another thing that you said earlier, Tiffany, that, that just struck me is we have to think about this entire user experience as more than what are the look and, look and feel and the colors. The days of looking at systems and saying, okay, how do you modify the user experience? Well, I modify the user experience. You can come over here and here's the color palettes and here's the selection of what buttons you want on the front screen and you can customize your user experience. Well, what we really see is I've got user personas that I want to drive a specific user journey and a path for that individual and that type of person in order to simplify the process, providing greater access to the course's content and information. So user experience or that entire user journey that provides accessibility is the bigger, broader conversation that I think is an industry we need to be talking about. And we need to eliminate the idea that it's just a bunch of colors and color palettes and a couple of buttons. This is really about how do we simplify that process and make it really, really, really easy for people to use and to work with. 
I want to add one last point on the accessibility, and it's not just access to the content, but it's also time to access the content. And that's another thing that um, clients, when they come in with that objective of a better user experience, might not necessarily have this in their mind, but we hopefully eventually get to, is you think about different industries. So I'm gonna give a couple of exam examples. We've got a waiter in a restaurant. We've got a flight attendant at the airport. We've got a bank teller in a bank and we've got just a, a corporate worker at their desk, right? Corporate worker at their desk typically can block off some time on their calendar, go into the system and just take their training. It's easy because that's kind of the majority of the workforce. You kind of expect that kind of experience. But the flight attendant is somebody who is likely having to take certain training so that the flight can take off um, or even use a pilot as an example. Training is being updated all the time. They need real time access and they need the, the uh, amount of time to take the training. So this is where having shorter training, bite sized pieces are really important. And then you know, the other one, the restaurant workers, they're signing into, there's multiple um, waiters or wait staff that are signing into a kiosk and they're having to complete their training. Because they're workers, they're not typically allowed to complete their training outside of working hours. So you have to make sure that as part of giving them access to the training, that you're also giving them time to complete the training as well. And I think that that's a big thing that is, often overlooked, but improves the experience for the user um, because it, it just takes away a whole level of stress for the end user. You know, that's really interesting. So we, you mentioned the word accessibility at the beginning uh, of kind of your opening that got us into this topic, but accessibility also means time, mm -hmm. right? So it's not mm -hmm. just, I'm gonna provide you access on a computer, Therefore, I've got to provide you a computer on wheels if you're made. I also have to provide time as a part of that accessibility and part of that user journey or the user experience. It's moving way, this, I love that this conversation is moving way beyond the technology and mm -hmm. it's all the things that have to be considered as a part of that process. I remember we were working with a, uh, a call center and it was actually a newer call center a number of years ago they were going to a completely virtual environment. So imagine a call center with 600 people, no office. Everything was virtual and remote. So all of the scheduling systems, all of the systems that determined uh, and directed calls, who was gonna get calls, how you checked in and out, all very, very complicated. And they realized in the process, God, we've got to provide time for these people not just to have breaks, but to have training breaks. We've got yeah. to get them in regular training. And so they began to work that into their scheduling system connected to their LMS and did all the cool techie things. But the reality was the workday became a mechanism for providing accessibility to training and knowledge so that those call center workers can perfect themselves, even though 600 people and they were all working from home. That's awesome. Hey, before we move on, uh, I wanted to ask our listeners just a quick question. Uh, what, what could having an on-demand team of functional system experts do for your business? That's exactly what the Blue Water Assurance Program provides. And we're able to partner with your team in order to fill in critical human resource gaps and can even give you the ability to focus on more strategic tasks for your business. We'll set you up with the learning and talent support you need whenever you need it. So if you're ready to get the HR or learning resources you need to succeed, check out our website at bluewaterlearning.com or hit the link in the podcast description below or wherever you, you pulled up the podcast today. Um, but moving on, uh, Tiffany and Chris, um, you know, user experience, and Chris, you mentioned this earlier, user experience is, you know, obviously the, the way a user experiences their journey through a website or a, you know some kind of online platform. Uh, but it's so much more than just uh, how it looks. I mean, you can have the best looking website in the world, but if I can't navigate it, if I can't get to where I need to go and, and in our world, you know, if I can't get to my compliance training or get to my performance review or, or a specific um, action item I need to complete like that within 
a click or two or three even, um, it, it's pointless. So uh, what, what are some, um, some things that you've seen from some of our clients that maybe that, that we can kind of just talk about as, as a kind of a strategy or a really cool, like, hey, we, we saw them do this or we helped them do that. That was kind of a, you know, a, a game changer or a problem solver that, that's really integrated into their overall experience. You know, if, if I can start by saying, I think one of the things that, that we need to think about is learner expectations. Mm -hmm. And when we deal with learning expectations, they're getting kind of crazy. In fact, I was listening to uh, a CNBC broadcast earlier today, and they were talking about how Amazon is going, is experimenting with using your cell phone as a barcode scanner so that you can go into the refrigerator and have things that are partially empty or you know need to be replaced you can actually scan them from the refrigerator, create your cart, push the button, done. Now your groceries are either ready for pickup or for delivery. And you never even had to leave your kitchen in order to be able to get that done. I mean, that's ridiculous level of granularity around accessibility. So this is where the learners are coming from is, I'm looking and seeking super, super simple ways in order to be able to make those things work. And so as we go through this process, I think that it's really important that we've got to be mindful that the learner is probably about four or five steps ahead of where we can be in terms of existing learning talent technology. That's okay, as long as we're always striving to yeah. simplify and make access that much easier. Yeah, and I think that leads right into my answer um, as well, Bennett, around what are things that we've done that have made an impact or we've seen clients do. Um, one is that, that change management conversation, right? And communicating to them, letting them know what's coming, getting, it, getting them excited, you know, giving them a little bit of the whiff of what's in it for me. Um, but then the other piece of that is typically when you are making an adjustment or you're setting up a system, you have a timeline and a budget and you can only do so much within that time. If we had all the money in the world and all the time in the world, we can make some really amazing things internally here at Blue Water. I know our clients would be able to create some really amazing things. That's just not reality. That's not typically how we're getting through projects or how we're managing the LMS. So one thing that I like to tell my clients is you don't have to do it all right now. Give them what's better than it was yesterday and provide them with the roadmap of what you're going to do next. And so Chris, kind of like what you were saying is about that continuously trying to make it better. Most of these, L well, the LMSs that we work with that we're seeing they're not sitting still. They're not staying as they are today. And they're making software adjustments. Businesses are changing on a day-to-day. -day. Having that roadmap to continuously keep people interested and, and even in some ways open up some way to get some information back from your end users. If you're a large organization and you've got 200,000 people using your LMS, have a way to collect information from them about what is and isn't working and adjust those and make adjustments if necessary or if if able to improve that experience. So it's not just that we stood it up, it's better, right? We're good to go. Instead, it's it's a thing that's continuous in the organization. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, and this is a, a bigger topic for another podcast, <laughs> the entire idea of the learning experience platform or the LXP came in because people wanted a better learning experience. But I believe what LXPs are finding is they're still constrained by many of the external factors that are impacting learners that learning management systems or other learning technologies or talent technologies uh, are impacted by. And so we look at that idea, there's a striving for that simplification for that uh, providing greater accessibility to content, providing greater accessibility to information. It's still a struggle because I think that we deal with the technology side and don't always deal with the what's happening outside the system 
that makes that process that much easier. And, and you have to do, if you really want to get there, you have to do both. So I love Tiffany, the fact that you're saying you got to go survey and ask questions to get that information. Don't miss out on the fact that you need to ask about well, what happens outside the technology that limits your ability to go access the information. And it could be like a conversation the three of us were having earlier this week with other team members is that we're not creating our own personal margin and time to be able to go actually handle some of those things. And that's not a scheduled activity. Maybe that's part of the process, or there's probably a whole lot of other things that are happening, but make sure you're focused on external or out of system activity process or impediments, as well as what's inside the system. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's no way a, a user experience strategy can be implemented by a single department, right? You know, just, just by yeah. their, their opinion of the business. Great point. I mean, you have, you have to talk to at least at a minimum kind of, you know, the, the, all of the department heads or, or all of the, the people that that's are in the different business units or are leading different business units. But I think the most successful strategies are built from, from the ground up, you know, the, the people the, being able to observe or, or interview or, or both, um, you know, particular employees from, from every part of the business um, and doing their day-to-day -day activities, understanding what they're doing outside of the system, like you said, Chris, that, that can have an impact on what then they have going on inside the system when they are in the system and, um, and how that all plays together, because there's no way you can just assume that or know that sitting from, you know, HR or, or learning department without, you know, getting that pulse of the organization. And Tiffany, I love the point you were making about this being a continuous process of improvement. I think anybody who has learning technology today, you have to plan in that the entire user experience and user journey is no longer something that you can configure and then come back two years or three years later and say, oh, let's update it. It's something that has to be an sure. active part of the maintenance and the improvement inside your system. So I love the fact you said that. Sure. Great. Well, I mean, I, to, to kind of close us down, I think uh, I think we've had some great discussions around user experience. You know, we as an organization, we do a lot of, of what we've been kind of talking about here to, to kind of help define that for other our clients and define that and, and implement that within their particular technology. So if, uh, if, you, if you're listening and, and have any questions, you know, Tiffany, myself and Chris are always here to, to talk about that further, um, give you some advice or even uh, bring you on as a, as a, as a new partner um, and, and help, the, the, you know, figure out what, what will work best for you. But um, Tiff, Tiffany, Chris, any, any final thoughts here on, on just overall user experience and accessibility? Ladies on the first, spot. Tiffany. I was just going to say, when you hear this and you think through this, it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be hard. Uh, agreed, but it is something you need to do. Go mm -hmm. focus on your learners, focus on your managers, just make sure that you're very intentional about the process. And, and I agree, Tiffany, this doesn't have to be a really expensive process. It can be just simple activities that you take on to make sure that learners have access to the learning that they need in order to be able to improve themselves in their jobs and their careers. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Tiffany. You know, when I think of user experience, I think of, you know, or at least changing the user experience in a, in a learning technology, you know, you immediately think of, oh, we've got to rebuild all of our custom pages and rebuild this, this you know, beautiful welcome page that we have that's not working anymore. You know, you get down into the into the weeds and, and do those, you know, user personas and user journey interviews, you may realize that it's just one or two configurations or one or two uh, naming convention issues that you have with your with your learning content that once these get fixed and the users are back to being completely thrilled and, and able to get through the system just as, as easy as they can and, and with, with and, you know, just as effective as, as they need to. So that's a, that's a great point. It doesn't have to to be this huge grand overhaul. It could be, uh, it could be just focusing on a couple new things and, and updating a couple things here and there. 
or it could be a huge grand overhaul. You know, if it's, there's some organizations that, that need there that are too. those too. Those <laughs> do happen. Yep. But great. And we, we, you know, appreciate your thoughts and opinions. And, and I think Chris kind of led us into probably our next topic. So we hope you check us uh, or tune into us next time as we kind of go into the LXP and what that is kind of shaping into be and, and how organizations are using those te technologies in addition to their uh, their kind of core learning management system technology and, and what that all means. So hope you tune in next week. We really appreciate you, you tuning in today. If you're listening to us and you want to see our faces, check us out on YouTube. Um, or if you're watching our faces and want to uh, just be able to listen to us as you're driving down the road, check out our podcast, uh, leave some comments and give us a rating um, and, and just kind of let us know how we're doing and how we can either improve or do something specific to you or, or you know, answer any questions or, or our inf information's on the on our website and the link in the podcast description. And, and uh, again, thanks so much for tuning in to the human side of learning and talent technology. We'll be back next week. And until then, have a great evening, afternoon, morning, or, or whenever you're listening. Thanks, mm -hmm. Tiffany. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Bennett. Thanks, Bennett. Thanks, Tiffany. Bye-bye.